2 Timothy chapter 4, let's begin in verse 9. Be diligent to come to me quickly. For Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world, and has departed for Thessalonica, Crescens for Galatia, Titus for Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, for he is useful to me for ministry. And Tychicus I have sent to Ephesus. Bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Troas when you come, and the books, especially the parchments. Alexander the coppersmith did me much harm. May the Lord repay him according to his works." You also must beware of him, for he has greatly resisted our words. At my first defense, no one stood with me, but all forsook me. May it not be charged against them. But the Lord stood with me and strengthened me so that the message might be preached fully through me and that all the Gentiles might hear. And I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. And the Lord will deliver me from every evil work and preserve me for his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet Prisca and Aquila and the household of Onesiphorus. Erastus stayed in Corinth, and Trophimus has, I have left in Miletus sick. Do your utmost to come before winter. Eubulus greets you, as well as uh, Pudens, Linus, Claudia, and all the brethren. The Lord Jesus be with your spirit. Grace be with you. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your word. We thank you that it won't return void and it'll accomplish every purpose that it's sent to accomplish. Lord, we we are so grateful, Lord, that you have built into our lives this foundation of your word. There's no other thing we'd rather turn to or can can turn to that have eternal value. Lord, we recognize that you said, Jesus, that your words will outlive the heavens and the earth. So we pray that you would use us, Lord, through what you want to do in us today, that you would use us and, 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 and help us to be vessels through whom you can do what only you can do. So we yield our spirits to you now. Help us to settle our hearts down and be ready to hear from you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. So Paul here is, this is the actually last most people believe this is the last book that the Apostle Paul wrote, and it's really a love letter. Uh, I mean, all of God's words are really a love letter when you think of God's intent behind it. Um, But this is the context for Paul here is great, great difficulty. You know, it's hard to, to write something and care for someone and give someone instructions and encouragement when you have this crushing weight upon you of hardship, and that's a perfect picture of what the Apostle Paul was dealing with. Paul's thesis to Timothy, he's already written one book to him, this is his second book, uh, is that he wants Timothy to endure through godly character. And so he, he, God wants us to endure, to be faithful, to persevere. Uh, there's so much flakiness and fickleness in the world today. It, it's funny when you're a new, new uh, person in the workforce, you don't have to do much to stand out, unfortunately. It's just really bad out there. If you just show up, you're on time, you work hard, just really simple things that used to be a given in our society, now you look like a superstar. Uh, And so faithfulness and enduring hardship is something that Paul's trying to help Timothy um, think about and focus on, and he wants to use himself as an object lesson because Paul had no problem pointing to how God was using him and helping other people learn from from his example, because there are different times where he says, follow me as I follow Christ. So he just had told Timothy, if you look back at verse 5 through 8, he says, but you be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry, for I'm already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith, Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. So he's written this to Timothy, and, and he's, dem- he's trying to help him understand by using him as an object lesson, He because Paul's been watchful in all things already. He's, been, he's endured afflictions. He's done the work of evangelist. He's fulfilled his ministry. He's fought the good fight. He's finished the race. He's kept the faith. All these things he has done, and now he wants Timothy to follow his example, and he wants Timothy to do the same and finish well, as he wants 
for all of us. It's easy to start things well. I can't, ima- I can't even remember how many projects, hobbies, things that I started really well. I was super good at them, but I just couldn't finish them. I just couldn't, there wasn't the character in me or the perseverance or whatever it is, the focus to be able to finish something. But, but God's called all of us to have a life of, of endurance, to, to focus on the goal, to focus on the prize, to keep Jesus as our focal point, looking into Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, and, and, and look after his example of perseverance. And so Paul, in his closing remarks here, he's going to update Timothy on some people. He's going to give him some real, you know, and this funny, this section, this last part of 2 Timothy, it's often overlooked in terms of the, just the, it just looks like peripheral, you know, kind of tidying up loose ends, you know, and, and just finishing out the letter with incidental things that are parenthetical or just, no, no, all of this is inspired by the Holy Spirit. It, it, there's so much there and people skip over these sections like this section or the end of Romans. And those things are so full of amazing, amazing truths here. So what we learn is we, we're going to learn some priceless lessons from these, uh, these verses this morning. And it has a lot to do with being faithful. It has a lot to do with being uh, consistent and, and enduring hardship and being faithful even when it's difficult to do something and to, to do so. Faithfulness is in our, in, in our lives will, will preemptively prevent things, about 95% of the things that happen in our lives that are difficult, faithfulness to, some, to God and to others will take care of, of so much of that. Because so much of the things that we deal with, a lot of the things are self-inflicted and they would be prevented if we would just be faithful. If we would just be faithful and be consistent and just no matter how hard things get. And God has all the resources we need to be able to be faithful and to be consistent. Have you ever heard the saying uh, that, that 95% of success is just showing up? And you tell that to your kids, just show up. Just show up. Just be there. You may not feel prepared. You may not feel like it's your best day. You may not feel like you're ready for whatever happens. But, but so much of success is just being there, just showing up. And so this morning, I want to look at some examples of faithfulness and and one example of unfaithfulness. And we, so we look at these verses, and we're going to look at a few different people here in these, they list in these verses. We're going to look at Demas, we're going to look at Mark, and we're going to look at Timothy himself. So I've entitled the message this morning, Lessons from Servants in Paul's Ministry. So let's, we have a lot of verses, so let's get to it. Verse 9, he says, be diligent to come to me quickly. So he beckons Timothy, he loves Timothy. Timothy is like his son in the faith. And he wants him to come because he's in prison. This is one of the, the, the passages where he's in prison, writing from prison. It's around the fall of 66, AD 66, and in the spring of 67, he's going to be martyred. He's going to be beheaded uh, there and lose his life, give his life for the Lord. He knows it's coming. He knows that it's coming soon, and he doesn't know exactly when, but he knows that it's imminent, and he wants Timothy to to come. And so um, he's in what's called the Mamertine dungeon. You can go there. If you go to Rome today, you can go into what's believed one of the places that he stayed, and it dates back to, you know, 6th century BC. It's very, very old. And, it, you know, they, those prisons in those days were really, really bad. Um, it, it wouldn't even be considered humane today to uh, to be in one of these types of prisons. It was actually a dungeon, and there were you know, different levels of this dungeon. So Paul has needs. He wants Timothy to come because in those prisons, like many prisons in in different places in the world today, your needs are supplied by people that you know. They don't just supply things for you like food and clothing and all these things. Your people that you know have to bring you these things, at least if you want to have those things in a consistent manner. So, but he longs to see his son in the faith. He says, come quickly, and, and, but he needs his physical needs met. And he mentions some of those uh, needs and things that he wants spiritually to be spiritually fortified. And, and he mentions that he's abandoned. This is so sad. Look at verse 10. For Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world and has departed for Thessalonica, Crescens for Galatia, Titus for Dalmatia. So 
I want to focus on Demas for a moment. He's the, he's the first of three, uh, and, and it isn't the first mention that we see of him in the New Testament. Uh, we're told in Colossians chapter 4, verse 14, Luke, the beloved physician, and Demas greet you. And then Philemon chapter 1, verses 23 and 24, he says, Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ, greets you, as do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, Luke, and my fellow laborers. So Demas wasn't just anybody. We're focusing on looking at him a little bit. It's not a good picture. But he wasn't just anybody. He was a faithful minister. He served with Paul. He sacrificed with Paul. He was persecuted with Paul. And, and, and so it just it's a lesson for us because we're told that he loved this present world. And so it's a good exhortation to us that we can get sucked into the world's ways of doing things and wanting things, and because and, and, it is connected to covetousness, if you study it out. We can get sucked into that. Even the best of servants, the most faithful of servants, we can start going down that path, and we have to always guard against that. And it doesn't happen overnight. We make little compromises. You know, as a, as a pastor that's been in ministry for a long time, almost 30 years, I've been not a pastor, but I've been in ministry one way or the other. I've watched people in the cycle of spiritual life. I've watched them come to know the Lord. I've watched them grow. I've watched them, you know, move away. I've watched them, all these things. You get to see just kind of how, the, how, how a Christian life is lived out. You, of course, you get to see it in your own life, but you get to try to help people in their spiritual journey, and it is a privilege. But what happens is what I've seen, and I've obviously seen it in my own life, where you you start compromising little things, and then those things lead to bigger compromises. And before you know it, you're doing things that you never thought you'd ever do again. And you ask yourself, and I've been in counseling situations with people, they're just, they're just baffled. How did I get here? And it happened by these little seemingly innocuous compromises that, or, or and or things that where God convicts you on something and you don't quickly repent. We need to repent faster and faster and faster. The time between we're convicted and the time that we repent needs to get shorter and shorter the more we know the Lord, not the opposite. And what happens is the opposite starts happening. And pretty soon we're not confessing our sins. We're not asking for forgiveness. We're, we're not being faithful. We're blowing off church. We're uh, doing any, any other thing that's, that, that we can do on a Sunday except being here uh, being focused on the Lord, and not just being here like a, a physical body in a seat, but actually having our heart engaged with the Lord and having Him uh, speak to us and having an open hearts to be doers of the Word, not hearers only. So it, it, there's this progression, and before you know it, you're unrecognizable. You know, a lot of times when people backslide, there, there's, there's an inward backsliding that happens way before anything outward for anyone else to see. We can fool a lot of people, but we can't fool God. And he loves us so much. And that's why his conviction is right there saying, that's, that's not right what you're doing right there. You would never do that before and, and dealing with us. And he wants to kind of redirect us and help us to see that we're in danger. That's why we need trusted, godly people of integrity in our lives that have the freedom to say whatever they feel like they need to say to us. Because we all have blinders, every single one of us, myself included. And we have to have, give people the freedom to be able to speak into our lives. And I know that that can't be a, a million different people, but, but God will always be faithful to supply a handful of people that we trust, that have been proven, that can tell us, hey, you're getting off track. Demas in a, is a picture of the seed that fell on the thorns. Remember the parable of the soils? Jesus said in Matthew 13, verse 22, now he who received receive seed among the thorns is he who hears the word and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he and he becomes unfruitful. Demas had been very fruitful at one point. Paul just didn't allow anybody to travel with him on these journeys. You know, he's, he, Paul had actually witnessed God work in his life, work through his life, and he felt like that was appropriate for him to come along on these journeys. There's a, there, there's a lot of trust and dependence upon one another on these missionary journeys. But things got in the way, and, and again, they don't happen overnight. There's a progression. And, and so eventually, whatever enticed Demas in Thessalonica, listen, became more important than God's calling on his life. And the eternal was focused on the temporal instead of the eternal. That's that's what, the world will always get us focused on something infinitely inferior to the eternal, and that is something that we get that is temporal 
that's finite, that's passing away, that's going to be burned up eventually. I always crack up how, how Christians, at least back in the day, used to deal with covetousness. They'd see a really nice car, and the way they would deal with it is they'd say, oh, it's all going to burn. It's all going to burn. That just, when someone, I, we used to joke about that. Whenever you hear a friend says, it's all going to burn, you know that they were coveting. <laughs> you know, and so we would, you know, f- very politely and nicely and, you know, jokingly point that out, and then they just ignore you and you change the subject. So we move on to something else. But, uh, you know, we have to have an eternal perspective, and, and, and God wants to, to, to help us so that we don't fall into those things. Again, it can happen to any of us. He was, a, he was the only example I want to look at today that's really a bad example, and it's a good searching question for us. Is our love for this present world, because that's what he says the problem is, he's loved this present world. He's loved what this world offers. This world, the, the, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life, those things get served up to us all the time. And if that's our priority, then we're going to, you can't serve two masters. So we're going to blow off the eternal things and focus on the temporal things. And it could be so many things in this world that are not even bad in and of themselves, but they're, for us, something that gets in the way. And and God's faithful to show us. The Apostle John would later write in 1 John 2, verse 15, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Do not love the world or, anything, or the things in the world. That's a good check on us, especially in our country. We have so much prosperity. It's, who, who ever talks about the sin of covetousness? <laughs> Whoever, what ch- church talks about that? It's even rare to hear it in churches today. And, you know, I like to, of course, tease my friends, you know, when they get something new. Hey, don't love the things in the world. Or, or you know, they're like, thank you. Go away. You know, and, and that's how they deal with me. But uh, I can't begin to tell you how many times I've seen a, a Demas in a church get swept away by the world, and all of a sudden now something temporal, something that's passing away is more important than eternal things, more important than, the, than what God has for them, and it's so sad. And we're, again, we're all susceptible to it. We all have to guard against that. And so now he says, Crescens left for Galatia. Titus for Dalmatia. And these are actually good things because Paul dispatched these people, these leaders, over various works. You remember the churches of Galatia. Paul's already written to the churches in Galatia. They remember them. They had the problem that they were trying to, they were allowing these Judaizers, these false teachers, to come in and teach them they had to obey the law, be circumcised, and obey the law of Moses in addition to believing in Jesus. They were adding to the cross. So Paul's dispatching. Uh, Christians here to go and follow up with them, to help them, to strengthen them. I mean, you, imagine planning churches and not having solid leadership in place before you leave. They, you know, Paul visited Thessalonica. He was only there the first time for three weeks. You know, and then he has to be concerned about their growth because the, the leaders are the ones that help the growth happen and, and teach and, and feed and, and tend and all those things. Now, Titus went to Dalmatia. I don't know if he was going to look for dogs or uh, 101 of them, or I don't know. But, uh, um, you know, I did some research if, just because I know you wouldn't be able to listen after this point unless I solve this mystery. Did these dogs come from Dalmatia? It's Croatia now. And the answer is we don't know. We don't. There's people very adamant on both sides. I just want you to know that. They're willing to plant their flag and take, you know, make a claim to that they know if these dogs actually came from there. I don't know if they have more firefighters or more fire departments or whatever. I don't, I don't want to get into all that. It's definitely not important. But, um, you know, Titus was a trusted servant and teammate of, of Paul, and he sends him to this area and pr- for much more noble reasons than worrying about dogs or anything like that. So, um, so this, these were good things that Paul's dispatching. You, would, you, you see it in his letters where he's sending someone here and he's sending someone there. He's writing ahead saying, receive this person. If you receive them, you're receiving me. So treat them like you would treat me. It was great how they did that in those days. They would send these, these letters. Now, Paul mentions two other servants in verse 11. Look with me at verse 11. He says, only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, for he is useful to me for ministry. So he says, only Luke is with me. This is Luke the physician. He wrote the book of Luke. He wrote the book of Acts. 
It's the only, he's the only Gentile author in the New Testament. And we know he's a Gentile because of his name and where he was from and, and everything. He, he did have, he did have uh, Jewish uh, influence. He had heritage and everything. But, um, you know, the, he, he, was a, he was a Gentile uh, as far as we can tell. Now, he's also mentioned in, in Colossians, Paul calls him the beloved physician. And when you, when you study Luke and you study Acts, you can see the language, especially in the original language, he's very precise. And he's very good at using anatomical words in the original language that they use to describe bodies and everything. He's very precise there. It's really neat to see that. But I just think of it from a practical level, like how often did Luke bandage up Paul? How many times did he have to do triage on Paul because of all of the persecution and everything? Just, what, just imagine what he saw Paul go through and be a witness to, but also um, see his miracles. See, I mean, he was, was, and when you read the book of Acts, the personal pronouns at one point change to we, and you know that that's when Luke joined them in the middle of the book of Acts. And then from that point on, he was with them the whole entire time. But then he gets to Mark, and, and he's known as John Mark. He wrote the book of Mark, the gospel of Mark here, and he's the, the second example of a person we can learn lessons from related to faithfulness. And the lesson that we learn from John Mark is you don't have to be perfect, especially when you start, to be used by the Lord in a great and significant way. And so um, Paul, what he says here is great, but it can't be fully appreciated unless you know that there was a division and a problem with Paul and John Mark at one point, because he went with him, he and Barnabas uh, on the, the first missionary journey. And at one point when it got really sketchy, because they were going to an area that was really dangerous, where people could die on the road with getting you know, attacked and everything. And he, he left, he went back at that time. And it just absolutely drove Paul crazy that he would be willing to do that and, and put his own needs above the team and all these things. You can just hear Paul talk about uh, all these things, and, and it would just be so devastating to, to them. But Barnabas was called the son of encouragement. It was through Barnabas that, that Saul of Tarsus, who would later become Paul, would actually be able to be in with the apostles because they were afraid to meet with him. They didn't believe that this was real, that Saul of Tarsus actually got saved, and it was through Barnabas that all that happened. He was a, a cousin of John Mark. They were related. They were in the same family. In fact, John Mark's mother's house is where they were all praying when Peter was put in prison and the, there was that an angel that, that broke him out of jail and he went there and they were all praying. That was John Mark's mother's home. So Barnabas was known to be gracious and, and, and everything and he was blood related. And, and so there was this dispute about taking, taking John Mark and, and they eventually um, the apostle Paul and Barnabas split up and they each took different uh, people. And, and, uh, but what's great is that now you see at the end of Paul's ministry, he validates John Mark. He says, he's very useful for me for ministry. And so Paul definitely didn't think he was useful for ministry in the beginning. And I bet you Paul would admit and say, yeah, I messed up. Or We don't know that. We can ask him someday. Was that really a mistake? Or where are you at? Like, where's this whole dispute that we've read in commentaries? Can you settle this for me? Because I'm tired of people taking all these different sides. And, you know, it's, they're even talking about dogs and Dalmatia and everything. And it's just bad. And I want you to settle this. Uh, so, but, you know, I love the fact that, because it's known that Peter kind of took him under his wing at one point. The, the Gospel of Mark, many believe, is, is basically Peter's account of the Gospel, telling it to to Mark. Uh, we don't know that for sure. It's another thing we can ask him. But uh, I love the fact that he says he is useful to me in ministry. And I, and I just want to pause here and just, we, we, we're just real people, right? When we, we know we mess up. We know we make mistakes. We know that we don't do it right all, all the time for sure. And it's just an encouragement to, to not allow our flesh or the enemy to discourage us from ministry because we feel like we've messed up. And, and maybe you sense a calling for a certain ministry and you've made mistakes and everything and, and God wants to encourage you that God can still use you. He uses flawed people. That's what he specializes in. And so there's, he's the God of not just the second chance, the third chance, the fourth chance, but he, we see so often, especially in our history of our movement, having these <laughs> imperfect, flawed hippies go out and plant you know, churches, and now there's 1,800 Calvary chapels and just in America alone from these very flawed people that the whole culture said are not worth anything, or a lot of them thought that, 
and they just went out and said, you know what? I'm changed. I'm a new creation. God can do anything with anybody, and I'm going to go out and respond to what he's calling me to do. If he can do that with them, he can do that with, with us. It's, it's, it's a beautiful picture of how God works. Now, verse 12 says, and Tychicus I have sent to Ephesus. Also in Colossians 4, Tychicus is mentioned as a beloved brother, a faithful minister, and fellow servant in the Lord. Paul sent him, so he's asking for Timothy to come, but what he, Paul is telling Timothy is that I've sent Tychicus basically for you to hold down the fort while you come to me. That's the idea behind that. That's what he's saying there. And then he says in verse 13, bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Troas when you come, and the books, especially the parchment. So these Roman prisons were very cold. So he had left his cloak behind at one point, and he's saying, bring it, because I, I need it. I'm cold here. There, there's not central heating and air uh, in, in, in these dungeons. And he says, the books, which those were made with papyri, papyri easy for me to say, papyri plant. Uh, and, and the, but then he says, the parchments, which were leather scrolls. So basically, Paul is saying, I want my Bible. I want the Bible. I want the Word. And, and it, that's a good reminder for us that, first of all, everything that Paul knew and understood and, and had that knowledge, he still didn't think he was ab- above learning. And, and, and there, there's room for growth. I think it's healthy for all of us to remember, no matter how much we know, how long we've known the Lord, we can still completely focus on sirens and get distracted and then get your attention back. No, we, all, we, we, can, we can grow. We can continue to grow. And that's what he wants to do. He, he wants to, and remember, he, he knows he's about to go to be with the Lord, but yet he wants God's word. He wants to, to grow. He wants God to speak to him. He wants God to encourage him. He wants God to pour into him. And he asks for the, you know, God's word to, to be able to be um, infused into his life even more and to, and to encourage him. I love that. And then he, he warns him of a troublemaker in verse 14. He says, Alexander the coppersmith did me much harm. May the Lord repay him according to his works. You also must beware of him, for he has greatly resisted our words. At my first offense, no one stood with me, but all forsook me. May it not be charged against him. So he, he says this, this coppersmith has done much harm. He warns Timothy, like, be, beware. And he says he has greatly resisted our words. That's what happens when you're serving, when you're helping, trying to help people grow, and you're in a leadership role, and people will not submit to God's word. They will, they will resist God's word, and they cause damage. He says, beware of them. They do, da- they, they do more damage than people realize by, by causing division, by teaching false doctrine. And that's one of the parts that's not the, that's one of the areas of ministry that's not fun for any healthy pastor because no healthy pastor wants to warn people or tell them to stop doing something or whatever it is. But for the, for the health of the body, they have to do it. For the, they have to warn people. They have to say, hey, this person's being divisive. We're, we're told in Titus to, to warn a divisive person up to two times and after that, reject them. You know, so that, that's something that is, I take very seriously. And, and so God wants unity. He wants peace. He wants all those, nothing in the way of us growing in our relationship with the Lord and, and being among God's people. And, and so he's saying, be, care, be careful. Now, in verse 16, when he says, at my first defense, no one stood with me, it's really describing like a, uh, an arraignment, basically. That's the way that we would uh, understand it. So Likely, Alexander the coppersmith testified against Paul with false accusations. So he says the first defense in verse 16 is talking about this, this, this proceeding. And in Roman, the Roman system, they'd have two trials. They'd have arraignment, and then they would have a trial. And at the first one, part of the proceeding was having character witnesses. And so what Paul is saying here, when he says, no one stood with me, He's talking about people, there's no one that's testifying on my defense of my character. No one is willing to come forward and testify and back me up that I'm not a criminal, that I don't deserve this treatment, uh, because the Romans believed in having a, a system of justice. They did. But, the, but there was no one that would defend Paul. And he says, but all forsook me. How sad is that to think about that? The person that sacrificed so much to bring the gospel 
to everywhere that, he, everywhere that he went and sacrifice, no one was willing to put their necks on the line. No one was willing to, stood, to stand with him, and they all forsook him. But he says at the end of verse 16, may it not be charged against them. Reminds me of when they were stoning Stephen decades earlier. And, and Paul, Paul went into, in his normal way of doing things in ministry, he would always start in the synagogue preach the gospel to the Jew first, then the Gentile, right? So he would go into, and he'd learn this from Stephen, because Stephen would, would, would testify in these synagogues, and no doubt he heard Stephen share. I mean, those, I believe that many of the seeds that were planted in Saul of Tarsus were done by Stephen. And at that martyr, done, when, they cast, when they cast stones upon him, he was holding, Paul was, or Saul, was holding the, the cloaks, of the people that were hurling these massive, because they would put you in a ravine and they would take these massive stones and hurl it down at you and you couldn't defend yourself against these stones. And, and that's what was happening. And what did he say, what, what happened at the end before Stephen died? He, he, he looked up and, and he said, look, the, the son of man is standing. It's the only time we're told that Jesus in heaven is standing because he's seated at the right hand of the father, but he stood for the first, the first, um, person in the book of Acts there that was, was you know, he was, a, um, he was a, a deacon. He was one that was ministering to the saints and everything, and he stood with him in that time. He stood with them in his time of death there, and Saul of Tarsus saw that. And so he takes after him in the sense, and of course, obviously, Stephen got it from the Lord Jesus, you know, saying, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. So ultimately, obviously, it's pointing to Jesus here. But Paul isn't bitter, bitter at God. In fact, he knew God would come through in some way. He knew God would, would do that. Look at verse 17. He says, but the Lord stood with me and strengthened me so that the message might be preached fully through me and that all the Gentiles might hear. And I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion." So Jesus himself stood with him and strengthened him. But why did he do that? Something selfish? Something that was for his benefit, Paul's benefit? No. He says that the message might be preached fully through me. Jesus stood with Paul in that moment during that trial. He stood with him and gave him strength so that he might fully preach that gospel and that all the Gentiles might hear. God's always going to come, come to our aid and help us, especially when we're trying to be faithful to preaching the gospel and obeying the Great Commission. He's going to get behind that. He's going to help us be faithful to that message. That should be a prayer that we all pray regularly. Help me be a good vessel and help me to have boldness to preach that gospel so that all the Gentiles might hear or anyone that God puts in front of me, a Jew or a Gentile. So he was faithful and strengthened him. And he says that, uh, he says, I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. That's a poetic way of saying I was delivered. I was right there at death. I was at death's door in terms of the conviction and where it would lead. But God delivered me out of the mouth of the lion. So I, I love the fact that God just came and compensated supernatural, supernaturally. And, and so now the second trial is coming. Paul knows that. He knows what's going to happen. He says, my departure is at hand. He knows it's coming soon. And he, talks, he says, I'm being poured out like a drink offering. He's, he's basically being an offering to the Lord, being in total submission to what the Lord wants. They probably gave him a chance to recant or to deny the Lord, and he'd be let set free, but he would not do that. He's going to be faithful. Jesus said, if, if you're um, if you're not, uh, you know, you don't stand with me, I won't stand with you in the sense of being ashamed of testifying before men about me. And, and he was going to be faithful all the way to the end. And then he says, verse 18, and the Lord will deliver me from every work and preserve me for his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. So deliver, he's going to deliver and uh, preserve Paul for, notice he says, for his heavenly kingdom. So he, he's, he's, he's thinking about heaven. That's the, that's the great escape. That's the, that's the great deliverance is to be able to go to be with the Lord. And he says he's going to do that. Other places he says he's going to protect what I've entrusted him against that day, the day where he gets rewarded, all his rewards. He's committed all those things to the Lord. He knows that God's going to preserve him and help him. And the, and the reason that there's no great threat to Paul ultimately is because he already died. 
Now, in the book of Acts, they were warning him about going to Jerusalem, and he said, none of these things move me. And it's been, it's been said it didn't move him because he had already died to himself. He had already died to his life, his, his God, you know, to God's agenda, and I mean, wanting God's agenda. And, and now, what can you do? The worst thing that anyone could do to me is, is kill me. But as a Christian, that's the best thing that ever happens to me because I'm with Jesus and I'm, and I'm in eternity. So we really have nothing to fear in terms of being faithful. And again, that's the theme here, to be faithful and be consistent. And where all that's going to lead, ultimately the worst thing that could happen is the best thing that can happen. And I think it's good for God to continuously bring that before us, for us to see that, to believe it, to accept it. Now, he still has a few closing remarks here, but they're, they're very important. There's, there's so much in these last verses here. He says, Greet Prisca and Aquila, it's also known as Priscilla, and the household of Onesiphorus. Now, Priscilla and Aquila are mentioned six times in the New Testament, and they were a huge, huge blessing, the Apostle Paul. They were partners with him in ministry, and they were greatly used. They weren't highlighted as great leaders or anything like that in the spotlight, but they were really, really important. And, then, and it reminds me of Rome, the end of Romans where Paul goes through all these people. I mean, dozens and dozens of people, these names that he lists, being, and many of whom are women, and how, how critically important they were to him and his ministry. How many people are just heroes or giants in the faith that no one knows their names? You know, it's been said that when we get to heaven, we're going to be surprised on people's rewards and who's there in the first place, who's not there. We're going to be shocked. And I just, the, the, you know, you hear these stories of these people that just pray for 70 years straight for things. And, you know, just these heroes in the faith that no one knows about, no one's ever heard of, but they're like these huge, you know, uh, amazing saints that do incredible um, things. And I think that these people would qualify as that. He says in verse 20, Arasta stayed in Corinth, but uh, Trophimus I have left in Miletus sick. Erastus was the treasurer of Corinth. And what's interesting is that they've recently found, in the last 10, 20 years, somewhere in there, they've found uh, ruins that mention him by name as the treasurer in Corinth. Yeah, but this isn't true. Like, we can't depend on this. This is men's fables. And like, no, everything in archaeology and backs it up and, and, and science. It's, it's a beautiful thing. Now, he says here that he left Miletus sick. This is interesting. Why didn't he just heal him? It's not like he can just turn on healing any time that he wants to. You know, this is a good thing for us to see. If, if he didn't tell him, okay, you need to, you know, confess this or whatever, or do this formula, and, you know, and, and he's just not just healing every single person that he comes to, just like the Lord Jesus didn't heal everyone uh, either. But he, he, he says, I'm giving you this update. He's sick. He's, he's been sick. And it doesn't mean that he wasn't going to get healed or recover or whatever, but he's updating Timothy. He wants him to know that he had to leave this person behind, and he's entrusting him to the Lord. And that's ultimately what God's called us to do, is to trust entrust people to the Lord. As much as we want them healed, we can continue to pray for them, but ultimately we have to entrust them to the Lord. He says in verse 21, do your utmost to come before winter. Eubolus greets you as well as Pudens, Linus, Claudia, and all the brethren. And he says, come before winter. The, 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 the way that the winds were, the way that the weather was in, in wintertime made it really difficult for them to sail certain places. So he doesn't want to have to wait for, for all that to pass, wait for winter to go by before uh, Timothy comes. He doesn't have much time left either related to this second proceeding that's going to happen. Um, Linus has been, has been referred to as the Bishop of Rome in, in church history. Um, maybe he was the inspiration for the peanuts. Uh, I don't know if he had a blanket and sucked his thumb, but um, I couldn't resist. I'm sorry. But um, this, this, this person here, the, the Hudens here, this is, history records this person as a, as a Roman senator's son, and Claudia is his wife there. So to me, it shows that there's all different kinds of people that were getting saved from all different socioeconomic backgrounds. They're all treated the same. They're all treated just as brethren or sisters in the Lord, and he, and he, and he, um, he wants to, them to be greeted uh, from these people that, that he um, can, has this communication with 
And, and that would be a huge blessing to Timothy and everyone that he shares this letter with. And then he, he closes in verse 22. He says, the Lord Jesus be with your spirit. Grace be with you. Amen. And what's interesting about this verse is that, so the word you can be singular or plural in Greek. And we have y'all, you know, or you all for you being plural. But we have you being singular. But they have, they, in, in this one verse, you, when he says, the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, that's singular. That's you singular. And then grace be with you, you is plural. So you could write next to that, y'all, grace be with y'all, or you all, amen. So he's saying to Timothy, um, you know, very personal, the, the Lord Jesus be with you, your spirit. And he says, grace be with the whole church or with you all, everyone that's reading this letter. So as I close here, the last example here is Timothy, this person of, of, of note here and someone that was a huge blessing to Paul. What we need to understand is that Timothy served as the, the uh, pastor or the bishop of Ephesus for 15 years. And Paul told him to remain there in 1 Timothy chapter 1, and, and he, he obeyed that, and he was faithful, and he was consistent, and he stayed there for a long time. John the Apostle eventually would be uh, another person that would oversee the church of Ephesus. The, it's, it's interesting to think about how Paul was at Ephesus the longest time recorded of any church. He was there for three years, and, and that produced so much fruit uh, for him to, to be there for that amount of time, and he could disciple and have such a strong uh, leadership core and how that would affect them ongoing and, and, and cause them to be a very fruitful church. So he, told, he tells them, he gives them this, this, this grace and everything, and this, this greeting here. But history, this is what I want to get to, history records that in the year 97, so just before AD 100, at the age of 80, Timothy tried to stop a pagan parade showcasing their idols and ceremonies and songs and stopping this pagan parade. And in response to preaching the gospel to them, these, they beat him, they dragged him through the streets and stoned him to death. And as a young man, he saw Paul be stoned at Lystra, and that was the city he was from. Saw him stoned at Lystra, and I think most people believe that's the time where Paul was caught up to the third heaven and heard inexpressible words that wouldn't be lawful to repeat at that time, and then came back at that point, and because they thought he was dead. They were convinced this is a dead man, and, and, and then he, he went to the lead, talked to the leaders of the city, and basically had them beg him to leave, and he was giving them permission for him to be uh, asked to leave, which is great. Um, so Timothy was faithful all the way to the end, all the way to giving his life for the Lord, and being faithful all the way to the very last breath. Faithfulness is the key to Christian maturity. Faithfulness is how God works in our life. It's consistency and faithfulness. I've told you many times as a joke when I was a new believer, they told me to be fat, to be faithful, available, and teachable. And I just had, maybe they thought I could only handle three things. You know, I don't know. But I just focused on those things. And through that, that's what God used to help, um, you know, prepare me for um, what he has, has had for me. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 2, we're told, moreover, moreover, it is required in stewards that one be found faithful. And it says it is required in stewards. What's a steward? It's a manager. So we are manager, managing God's resources, his time, his money, his gifts, his influence through our lives. We are managing those things. And what notice it says it is required. It's not best practice. It's required. If we're going to be a good steward of what God's entrusted to us, He's called us to be faithful. You know, it, it, it's amazing to me how little faithfulness we see in our world, but also in some parts of the body of Christ. Faithfulness is important. Consistency is important. Being a, someone that someone could depend on. You know, all these things that happen when you come here that are done well, and you don't even realize who's behind the scenes doing it, who's coming and cleaning the church, who's who's uh, preparing communion, who's like, there's faithful people that do those things. And, and, and that's how God develops us and uses us. And I have it. I don't shy away from it. If someone can't be faithful to just being a consistent part of the body of Christ, they're not even an option 
related to someone that's there for service because that's the foundational thing is being faithful and not just to church, faithful in your family, faithful as a friend, faithful as a spouse, faithful as a father, mother, just being faithful where people can depend on you. What do we want to hear in the end? Jesus said in Matthew 25, verse 23, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. He doesn't say good and talented servant, good and charismatic servant, good and skilled servant. It's all about faithfulness. And the great encouraging thing to me, and when I was a new believer, it really encouraged me. That's what God's looking for. It's faithfulness. I have control over that. <laughs> I can do that. I can't, I can't make myself more gifted. I can't make myself more charismatic or speak well or any of these things. I can't make all that happen, but I can make myself be faithful by God's grace. Because as I, as I depend upon Him, the fruit of the Spirit comes forth through my life. Faithfulness and self-control, all these things that help us with being faithful. So I think it's just a good word. I just think God um, wants to encourage us as things get worse and worse in this world, as we do more outreach. We haven't even started yet, but when, as we do increasing outreach, and, and things, there are going to be new people in here, and it's, God wants to use our example to help them see, this is what, oh, this is what it looks like to be a believer. This is, what, this is my, what I'm aiming for. I'm aiming to be this person well, we have to be an example. We have, to be, we have to show them this is what it's like. It's someone that's be dependable. My yes is my yes. My no is my no. And, and we're led by the Holy Spirit. It's very important for us to be found faithful. I love it. Let's pray. Thank you for your word, Lord. Thank you for Paul's faithfulness. Thank you, Lord, that he didn't let anything get in the way. Thank you that he depended upon you. Thank you that you came and strengthened him and helped him in his time of need. Even though everyone de deserted him, you didn't deserve him. Jesus, you said to us that you'll never leave us nor forsake us. Lord, we thank you that flawed man, sinful man, well-intentioned man can do what they do, but you will always be there for us. You will always be dependable. So, Help us, Lord, to grow and exhort one another daily, even the more as we see the day approaching, Lord. Help us to stir one another up towards love and good deeds. Help us, this fellowship, this family, to be faithful, Lord, for your glory. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.